thinking about this morning, um, future glory, as we uh, turn again to Romans, the eighth chapter, and as David was singing, um, how God uses uh, mountains in life that uh, may seem impossibly difficult uh, to help us. And... Uh, to grow us, uh, and to draw us close to Him. So as we come to God's Word, we pick up in Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And after talking about a number of the, the challenges, difficulties, troubles, and tribulations Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Future glory. For years, the hymns of the Christian faith would often have a concluding verse anticipating the glories of heaven. All hail the power of Jesus' names concludes, Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Praise my soul, the King of heaven ends this way. Angels in the height adore him. You behold him face to face. Saints triumphant bow before him, gathered in from every race. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise with us, the God of grace. And of course, when we sing Amazing Grace, how does that conclude? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing his praise than when we'd first begun. Keith Getty and Stuart Townend, in a newer hymn written in 07, uh, In Christ Alone, says, No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Clearly, 
It is this Christian hope of future glory that has been and continues to be an encouragement, an enticement, uh, an expectation, an inspiration, uh, a reinforcement to keep our eyes on Jesus every day here and now and to follow Him even when life is really hard. And there's times when we deeply feel the sting of disappointment, discouragement, disillusionment. And why do we feel the sting of disappointment? When we appoint things other than the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God to satisfy our deepest longings, you understand, brothers and sisters, that those things need to be disappointed. Christ is our deepest satisfaction. When we set our hopes on illusions of utopias on earth, designed and sustained by human schemes, those illusions need to be dismantled and shown for the illusions that they are. We need to be disillusioned with such things because Christ is our reality. Romans has been clear throughout the first half of the book on the reality and the harshness and the hardships of life in this world. And so when we read verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, Paul is not whining about hard beds or high gas prices or hangnails. Paul is writing about what he has experienced, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and sword. Ultimately, he dies, church history tells us, by the sword. Death or life, and then he turns to the spiritual realm, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, this charge is sometimes brought against such hope in future glory is that Christians can be so heavenly minded that what? We're no earthly good. I guess it's possible. But historically, that has not been the case of the Christian church looking up the history of hospitals in that bastion of, of conservative Christian thought, Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, it's not, is it? But it's what it says, history of hospitals. Public hospitals, per se, did not exist until the Christian period. Hmm. Toward the end of the 4th century, maybe in the late 300s, the second medical revolution took place with the founding of the first Christian hospital in the Eastern Byzantine Empire by Basil of Caesarea. Okay, that would be in Turkey today. And within a few decades, such hospitals had become ubiquitous in Byzantine society. Ubiquity is not a disease. It means they were pervasive. They were springing up everywhere. Early or European exploration brought the hospitals to North America, Africa, and Asia. Early Chinese and Japanese hospitals were established by Western missionaries in the 1800s. Catholic hospitals were largely staffed by Catholic orders of nuns and nursing students until the population of nuns dropped sharply after the 1960s. So you get the picture here. Since the 300s until after World War II and indeed after the 60s, it was after World War II that government started getting involved in hospitals some. It was in the late 1900s and into the 21st century 
that modern hospitals as we know, many of them for profit, and government-run hospitals came into prominence. So just in the health field, consider that. Government's the latecomer to the health care. And it's still way too soon to assess if that's going to be a good thing in the long run for the sick and infirmed or a setback. Will government and corporate health be best for patients? We'll have to, we can't analyze that right now, but one day it will be. Clearly, though, see this, Christians were so heavenly minded, they were motivated to much earthly good. And that is still the case. Losing a sense of future glory does not tend to lead to greater compassion and mercy and grace to others. I mean, think about it. If right now is all that there is, then we better grab all we can now because darkness follows. But if we understand rightly that we're to live each day to the glory of God with love for others, knowing that all eternity is ahead with joy that our minds cannot yet even imagine. We are then freed and empowered to make each day really count forever. Drew reminded me this week of a quote from C.S. Lewis regarding future glory where he compared our willingness to settle for the pleasures of this life rather than pursuing uh, the glory of God and the goodness of God. And Lewis compared it to an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what it is to have a holiday at the beach. It's not even in his imagination to the degree that our focus is on making the best of life now because this is all there is or all that we know versus making the best life now, anticipating that the best is yet to come by the grace of God and through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're comparing mud pies in the slum to vacations at the beach. A lack of awareness and anticipation of future glory, historically and presently, does not make us more compassionate, concerned, or considerate of the sufferings of others. I mean, just think about it in our culture today. If it did, we would be living in a culture where the leaders of our nation and world and all the talking heads on televisions would be telling us and showing us daily just how wonderfully peaceful, loving, compassionate, kind, merciful, gracious, and considerate people are to one another almost everywhere. What channel do you see that on? And if you did, it would be fake news because that is not how people live, is it? We're not a people right now that live for future glory. And we're not a people right now that are very kind and compassionate as a whole. When we look at our world, that's where the church is to still shine today. See, where Christian influence is greatly suppressed, even to the point of being unheard of, and where it's greatly diminished, human value, human worth, human dignity are not elevated. In fact, even where human beings promote themselves to being autonomous, godlike creatures, we still don't see human dignity promoted. So my concern in future glory is not that we would be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good and 2,000 years of Christian history tell a different story anyway. And we've not even talked about 
care and compassion for the poor. The precursors of what we think of as hospitals started as places to care for the poor and the homeless and the, and the sick. Leper colonies were put together. And in times of plague, who do you think it was that stayed to help the sick? The people that thought this life is all there is, I better get out of Dodge. Or the people who knew that if the plague gets me, I'm still in the hands of Jesus and there is a future glory. And right now, out of love, these people need me. And Christians stayed and they ministered again and again and again. You can live with concern for others when you know this life is not all there is. So the Bible tells us some things about heaven, but, but not in great, great, great detail. And I'll have to tell you this. I tend to be a little bit of a skeptic, maybe more than a little bit of a skeptic, when someone says, you know, I've been to heaven, and I'm back, and I want to tell you about it. I'm not saying that it can't happen or that it's never happened. I'm just saying I have questions about that. I have some doubts about it. And, and even if they sincerely believe that that is exactly what happened, I'm still not sure. And, and part of it is we have been duped before. I mean, there was a guy who wrote a book, made a movie, and then said, actually, none of that actually ever happened. So we don't know. But we're not basing whether heaven is true on people who have made a journey there one way or another. So I'm skeptical about that, but I am not skeptical about heaven itself, about the promise of God, about Jesus, who said that we can take comfort in knowing that he has gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we will be also, John 14. That we take comfort in. And it's a place. Psalm 33, 13, and 14 talks about it's the dwelling place of God. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9, our Father who art in heaven, heaven. And when the crucified and risen and glorified Christ ascended into heaven, Acts 1, 11 tells us he ascended into heaven. According to Hebrews 12, 22 through 25, there is this great sense that the church militant, that is the church today, the church that is still fighting sin and the devil, the, the church, according to Ephesians 6.12, that deals with the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, that church, this church, and the church triumphant, that is those who have, by God's grace, through faith in Christ Jesus, come to a saving faith and have died, those souls are now in heaven. And Hebrews 12 suggests that in some way, both we as we gather, we are before the throne of God today, and they are before the throne of God, and we are both worshiping the living God. And then all on one day, all of Christ's people, will be there with Christ forever. Renee was leading us in singing, oh, would this be the day? Would this be the day that he would, would come? And so we lay hold of the promises of God. Jesus prayed this in the high priestly prayer of John 17, verses 5 and 24. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. We, we will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. That's the future glory. And in the mystery and reality of living in the already and the not yet of the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, according to Ephesians, the throne of Christ at the Father's right hand and the life of Christians, those who are in Christ Jesus today, are both in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1.3 and 1.20, Ephesians 2.6. While we're in our present bodies, the realities of heaven are yet unseen. We know them only by faith. 2 Corinthians 4.18 and 5.7, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For we walk by faith and not by sight. So the hope founded on what the Christian faith sees gives us courage to persevere in life. In Romans 8.25, Paul wrote this, if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And in 1 John 3.3, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So what we do know about heaven Though not in full, but what we do know gives us an idea of what we can expect in future glory. 1 Corinthians 13, the famous love chapter of the Bible, we love that chapter, concludes this way, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, and now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. Our communion with God and with other Christians will be unbroken. The end of the 23rd Psalm, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Revelation tells us, Revelation 21.4, there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. And in Romans, we've already noted that it tells us that all creation has been subject to futility because of sin, that all people groan under it, and yet all creation will be fulfilled in the freedom of the glory of the children of God, verse 21. We were made to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. That is our joyful, high calling for life. And we get tastes and hints of it here in this life. Whenever we have victory over sin and evil, we get a taste of that. Whenever a person moves by faith from death to life through the power of the gospel, we get a taste of it. The joys of human love give us a taste of that. The ordinary means of grace, reading, and the proclamation of the Word of God, prayer, baptism, the Lord's Supper, all of that and more add to our glorifying and enjoying God right here on earth every day, making it count. And then on top of that, we have the triumph of the Lamb that was slain and His saints with Him. And so, as Andrew read from Revelation 5 today, we were hearing of the one who is worthy. I saw one who was slain, but he was worthy to open the scrolls and have the declarations of praise come to Him, glorifying and enjoying God forever. The hope of this future glory is our union with God and God with His people. God will be in the midst of her. And He will be their God and we will be His people. Revelation 22.4 says that we will see His face. 
and we will bear his name on our forehead. I don't know exactly what that'll be like, but I can't wait. And this is in fulfillment of covenant promises because that's what God does. He makes promises and keeps them that he will be our God and we will be his people forever and ever. That promise comes over and over again. Jeremiah picks it up in 30, chapter 30, verse 22. It's beyond our imagination. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and our minds have not conceived what God has in store for us. And Ephesians 2, 7 says, So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 3, 9, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Have you ever said, I just don't get it? I just don't understand. It just doesn't seem fair. There's so much we don't understand in this world. But one day, God will make it clear. Future glory will include things that just don't make sense now as he unravels for us the mysteries hidden for ages. And he brings to light the immeasurable riches of his grace. Immeasurable riches. Think of that. Immeasurable. He shows us the riches of grace in Christ. I said, whew, that's overwhelming. He goes, yeah, we ain't started yet. There's more immeasurable riches. We do bear suffering in this life, and it comes in different ways at different times, and it is not equally distri distributed. But Jesus told us that we would have tribulations. The encouragement that we have been hearing throughout Romans, uh, particularly chapter 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And then Paul says in verse 18, for I consider. There he's not saying, you know, I've got this, hey, this thought just ran through my mind. When he says, for I consider, he is saying, I have come to this settled conviction that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed to us. A future glory as joint heirs with Jesus. On September 2nd, 1945, the documents of surrender officially ending World War II were signed by the Japanese and the designated representatives of allied nations. General Douglas MacArthur uh, oversaw and officiated the ceremony aboard the USS Missouri. And he was the last to sign on behalf of the United States. MacArthur was flanked by military colleagues. He took out his Parker fountain pen and he signed Douglas. And then he handed his pen to General Wainwright. And he signed Mac. And then he handed his pen to General Percival on the other side. And he signed Arthur. What General MacArthur was doing there was honoring two U.S. generals who had suffered severe persecution as prisoners of war. They had suffered, but they had persevered. And now he invites them to share and the glory of victory. The Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, conquering sin and hell and the devil, 
chairs. Why? Immeasurable grace shares his glory with his church. A future glory that motivates us today. We get a glimpse of this so that we will persevere in the spiritual battles that we fight this side of heaven, knowing that we are fellow heirs with Christ and that those who share in the sufferings of Christ in the present will also share in his glory, a future glory. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, we see the gospel spread out before us. The, we, we don't crucify the Lord again on the, the table. We see the gospel, the body and blood of Christ Jesus given up on behalf of his people. What people? Well, his people in Old Testament times before he had come. His sacrifice was for them. And the people that he ministered to in his incarnation, his sacrifice was for them. And the people who would, by grace, through faith, come to put their trust in Christ as Savior and Lord up to this very moment, it's for them, the gospel, that we would see again with our eyes, that we would touch and hold, as well as hear the gospel message. And as we do each month, as we come to Holy Communion and eat the bread and drink the cup, we're making a proclamation of faith in the power of the atoning death of Jesus Christ for our sins. It was finished. And our hopeful expectation of future glory when he comes again. Amen. This is God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. <music>